Let's go. NBA preseason is off and running. If you are a total NBA degenerate like I am, you are grinding the preseason games, watching, got my laptop up, watching the preseason games, barely watching Monday Night Football, to be totally honest with you. Barely watching Monday Night Football because I was so excited for NBA to get back. I even brought out, I got to show it, he brought out the Darius Miles represent represent for Southern Illinois, St. Louis, Darius Miles jersey for today's show. Super excited, super excited. Um, seriously, though, uh, I am like really, really excited for the NBA preseason to get back here. It's really fun to watch some of you know the new players, guys on new teams, um, and see some teams that are maybe even still fairly similar, like say the Golden State Warriors, and see some of the changes that they've made. And I think as it relates to these best ball drafts, or even if you're in, you know, playing season long, there's a lot that we can take away from these these preseason games. You know, it's a little bit similar to um, NFL preseason, where it's not necessarily as much, you know, like the box score that we're trying to take away. You know who scored the most points or whatever. And sometimes that matters, but you know, usage, who's playing with the starters, who's, who's maybe not getting garbage time run, right? Who, what kind of roles do guys have one, um, two, two really jumped out last night to me, just to use it as examples before we hop into a draft here on underdog promo code spike on underdog um, was the first was definitely Jordan Poole, which I think we all saw coming there have been a lot of rumblings about Jordan Poole being a starter. Jordan Poole being in the starting lineup for the Warriors. And we did see that. And he smashed. He crushed. Jordan Poole was absolutely awesome last night. And the Warriors are chucking up even more threes than they did before. And so uh, I know a lot of the people in the Spike Week Discord have been drafting have been drafting Jordan Poole already. But if you haven't, uh, the ADP is going to be on the rise. So I would uh, get out in front of making sure I get some late round Jordan Poole exposure. I'm not sure, you know, like how incredibly impactful he's going to be. He's still playing with Steph Curry, right? Draymond Green, Draymond Green, Andrew Wiggins, and eventually Clay. But I think like if you watch that game last night, Jordan Poole was like a very, very active member of that offense and having him as like this, like baby clay in that offense take, it was, was allowing, you know, Steph to take a little pressure off Steph. And I think Jordan Poole, you know, he may not fill up the box score with, with the ancillary stats. And so like in a traditional season long league, how many, you know, of the, uh, how many of the categories is he helping you, helping you in? I'm not sure, but in, our best ball drafts where it's points based. I really, really, really like Jordan Poole in late rounds. And I feel even more confident about that after last night. And the other really, you know, big boost for Jordan Poole is if something were to, you know, if Steph rests or sort of God forbid something happens to Steph, Jordan Poole could be an absolute rocket ship. So Jordan Poole was probably the biggest takeaway, which again, I think we kind of saw coming. The other one was, um, well, I guess th th there, there was a few, and we can recap just a couple of them real quick again before we hop into a draft here. Um, the Spurs look really exciting. Space in the floor. Uh, DeJounte running the show, I think. Um, maybe a little confirmation bias because I was really high on DeJounte before, but now I think it's wheels up for him. And and I think the Spurs, all like just about every Spurs player in drafts, including even like Jakob Pertl, guys like that, um, can can be value picks. You know, Derek White didn't have a phenomenal game, but I think that the upside is massive even for him too. Tyrese Maxey, the gem of the offseason, had a pretty poor performance, but we also saw him running the show, being the go-to guy in the offense without Joel Embiid and Tobias Harris, and so I think he's going to be just fine. The uh, other kind of fascinating thing I thought, well, A, Precious Achua, another one of our gems, my guy, Precious Achua, my favorite uh, late round pick, started at the five for Toronto. Now, um, Pascal Siakam, Kem Birch, and Chris Boucher were all out, as was Gary Trent. And so not certain that Precious will start there, you know, when the, when Boucher and Birch are, are back. 
but we saw how productive he can be wildly productive in the minutes that he gets. And I think the more he gets to play here in the preseason, he's only going to earn more. His teammate, Scotty Barnes, rookie Scotty Barnes, put up a monster stat line. A little bit, a little bit boosted by he got some garbage time run. He came back in with about seven minutes left in the fourth quarter to play against the Scrubs, which was you know nice for his like if he played DFS last night was nice for Scotty Barnes. But he also just showed what he how he stuffs the stat sheet. You know, this is kind of what he's going to do. He's not going to be a super high usage player, but he's going to do a little bit of of everything and hopefully continue to grow. He's a really talented player. Um, so Scotty, he also other big thing that I meant to point out was Nick Nurse hinted that he wanted to see Scotty with the, the the second unit. And he did that. He staggered Scotty Barnes um, to the, to the second unit. So away from Fred Van Vliet, you know, away from what will be Pascal Siakam away from Goran Dragic. Like he, he was playing with, you know, these backups, Malachi Flynn, Yuta, what's you know what Tan Bay, I always struggle to say his name, Steve McKayluke. He's playing with all those guys and was kind of like the focal point of the offense with that that unit. So that was really big for Scotty Barnes, but these are just a couple of different examples from last night to be more tonight and more, you know, we got what, like 19 straight days or something, you know, million straight days of, uh, of, of preseason action. But I think that there's actually plenty that we, that we can learn if we're focusing on the right things. So let's go ahead and hop in. Let's go ahead and get in the draft here. Let me share my screen. I know you guys are probably way more interested in the actual drafting part of it than listening to me talk about my players that I am uh, that I am excited about. Let me get in here and I'll answer your question, Terrence. One more. Oh, and we fill. That was good timing. Perfect. Perfect to be talking uh, for five minutes and then let her fill up. Watch a few of your videos. Where are you on OG? Also on OG, the Raptors are just a team I really want to be on. OG, um, you know, OG is like this, like to me, this super incredibly safe pick in the, the rounds that he goes. Let's look up his ADP really fast. A six of 64, right? So in the sixth round, you can get OG. And especially on underdog, we know how weak the wing position is. And he obviously fills that wing position. He's also an incredible steals and blocks player. And we know how important that can be. Also on underdog, the big, the big thing you want to see from OG to be a smash pick is taking a step forward from a usage perspective on offense. He needs to be more of a factor on offense and not just standing and watching Fred and Lowry and Pascal and Trent and these guys all play. And what I, what we did see last night was they kind of force fed him a little bit and he was a little bit more aggressive in ISOing. Like there were some, there were some OG ISOs, there was OG post-ups. There were they were actively trying to bring OG into the offense a little bit more, was it, which was exactly like you know the thesis behind taking him where where he's going in drafts. Is you don't need him; to, he doesn't need to have a you know a twenty five percent usage rate, but he just need, he he needs a little bit more, right? He needs to take on a little bit more of a role, and he can absolutely smash. And so, some guys were out last night. It's just the first preseason game. Not trying to take away too much, but I think OG. Um, just like a lot of these other Raptors, I think OG is an awesome pick. I, lo- I love OG to continue to kind of uh, grow offensively, which we know what he does defensively, um, and continue to shoot the ball better. There's been some hype videos uh, of OG, like, you know, uh, in the offseason working out, shooting, dribbling, you know, actually doing some some non-3 and D things here. Definitely going to take Cat here. That was a nice gift. That was a nice gift. But yeah, excited about the Raptors. I was very excited to watch that Raptors game, and I I left even more excited. Van Vliet looks like he's going to be a a fantasy stud. He kind of always is, but now you remove Lowry and put Drogic in there, and I think that that's a pretty significant upgrade for Fred. OG looks awesome. My guy Precious. I'm very excited for Precious. Scotty Barnes looks good. And then, you know, Boucher is going to be Boucher when he comes back. And Pascal and Pascal has upside too. I like all, all of these Raptors. Agreed. Let's do it. I don't know how many, I don't know how many drafts drafts you've done. I haven't done one since uh maybe like the end of last week. And so I don't know uh too too much how much like all my guys have moved. Hopefully, uh some of our late round flyers like Poole, like Precious. 
like Scotty. I know Scotty Barnes has already risen up a bunch. Josh Giddy, I thought Josh Giddy, um, you know, getting the start. Josh Giddy getting the start last night and uh, playing a, you know, he's kind of doing this like point point guard slash point forward slash doing a little bit of everything. They don't have very good rebounding in their lineup with Shea, Giddy, Dort, Baisley, and Roby as the starting lineup, which I kind of think they'll carry over. Um, depends on what you think they do with Poku, but um, I kind of think they'll carry that starting lineup over, and they don't have a lot of rebounding. So, like, that's kind of a boost, a nice boost for a, a, a pick like Kitty because he will go get in there and get some boards. Yeah, Scotty, uh, you're not you're not counting on Scotty to be uh, – hitting a bunch of contested jump shots. <laughs> He's kind of the stuff, the stat sheet kind of guy, but I, but I'm like, Scotty was probably my favorite prospect in the whole draft in this whole draft. Um, so uh, very excited, very excited for him. Oh, now see, now you guys are going to put the, put the pressure on me with Zion. I'm still taking Zion. I'm not worried about the knee. I'm not worried about the injury yet. <laughs> I'm going to preface it by saying I'm still taking, I'm kind of buying the dip here on Zion. Zion is a first round player to me. If you see my rankings, I have him very high. And I think Zion is an absolute smash pick, especially because you get to draft him as a wing, which as we discussed earlier is very, very thin. And so I am trying to buy Zion and, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully he stays healthy and hopefully this injury is not a big deal. It's a little bit of a risk, but I'm willing to, that's one I'm willing to take right now. Yes. Um, well, so two part question with the Giannis knee is Jokic more of a no brainer at one. Yes. Um, does it change your ranking of Giannis? No, not yet. And I say that because largely because of position, I love cat cat is one of the guys I'm highest on, you know, how high can you be on a guy that goes like what is he going sixth or seventh overall and you have and i have him fourth or whatever um but the Giannis thing is like positional you know Giannis being a wing here on underdog is huge um and big and the, the big position is just a little bit deeper and obviously and guard is like very deep so i still keep Giannis ahead of because we just know even if Giannis is going to miss some games and even if Giannis comes out of the gates maybe even like sluggish or not playing back-to-backs or, or, or something like that when he's out there the points he's going to put up at the wing position are unmatched right the per game production from Giannis is just kind of unmatched and so um, I'm not moving him down but again all these injuries are like we have to monitor them right because games played are such a huge part of this right that's why we take a lot of these younger guys we take maybe even some guys on some bad teams because or guys, you know, teams fighting for the playoffs, right? Kind of like Zion for that reason. Like the Pels are trying to get into the play-in. And so he's not not as likely to be resting down the stretch or taking off back-to-backs, et cetera, even though there's some injury risk. But we have to monitor these, these things. We have to monitor these things. 20. I like it. And 90. Matt, I know you're a sicko. I think I'm in the 30s. I'm in the 30s. Football is football is uh not it's not uh helping me here basically is what i would say Ooh, this is see how ja and and lamello are definitely my like quote unquote guys right here and i am actually going to take mpj again wing thing kind of betting on just the unicorn upside without jamal murray I actually don't have a ton of MPJ, which is not really something like that I planned. <laughs> um, just kind of how drafts have, have shaken out. I see that uh, uh, like Jalen went a lot higher today. And Jalen was a guy. I have a ton of Jalen so far um, that I've been kind of taking over MPJ. But yeah, so much has changed. I know. Do you, Matt, I know that you remember like our first drafts that when they opened this that we were doing and we're taking all these guys. Right? I mean, it really is crazy for anybody that didn't start drafting, like kind of right after they opened this thing. I mean, let me just look up some guys that have probably risen. Uh, Scotty Barnes is a great one. Scotty Barnes is going at 107.5 ADP. 107.5. 
Uh, you probably got him in the 160s when we first started. Josh Giddy, 131.9, same thing. Josh Giddy was a second to last round pick. Um, let me think about this. Keldon, Keldon going in the 60s, going in the sixth round. Keldon was like a ninth round pick, you know, and on and on. Um, my guy, DeJunte is going in the 30s now. He was in the 50s before, you know, so so much really has changed. A lot, a lot has changed in the market. That, that's just kind of how it goes. The market's going to get more efficient. But there's also, you know, we, we see it in every draft season of every sport. Guys are going to fall down. Guys are going to, guys are going to rise up, and we'll we'll just keep moving with the tides. But uh, it is a little unfortunate that we that we all. I mean, the problem is a lot of the drafters are all of us. We're all we all. It's like a, half the drafts are like all the Spike Week people and uh, and people that are like in the know drafting all the same guys so of course we're rising up their adps maxi right what's maxi doing what where's maxi at maybe maxi will fall back now yeah inside the top 100 is tyrese maxi he again used to go in the 15th round or 14th round or whatever so yep maxi was like basically undrafted now he's a ninth round pick or whatever it's crazy I think it's going to pick up steam. It's a good question. I'm not. I I'm not certain if it will, uh, but I think it's going to pick up a lot of steam. I mean, it's going to pick up steam for me personally over the next two weeks or whatever it is, however much time we have left. Um, I think it's going to pick up some steam. So it'll get close. It'll get close. Ja, what just what, what is your username? T Bear. Let me pull this up. Ooh, the guard heavy. Yeah. I like it. Luca Fox. Can't really go wrong with Luca Fox. Dang it. Fred. Fred falling. Matt. It's always Matt. It's always Matt taking, taking my guy. Every time Matt takes my guy. It's all right. Dejante is fine. I remember the days when I was getting him so much later though. Now I got to buy him at, uh, I think this is, I think this is still efficient for me. So like, uh, I don't think some of these guys should go at, like, I don't think DeMar DeRozan should go ahead of DeJounte. I don't think Brandon Ingram. Um, I think DeJounte and Shea is actually a pretty close discussion. And so I don't think um, I'm not out on DeJounte at this price right now, but I, we're, we're going to get there pretty soon, probably, where it's time to back off on him, I think. Uh, good question. Ben Simmons is a very good question. Ben Simmons, 43. That's about, I think it's maybe a handful of picks. I'd have to ask like the underdog people. Um, maybe falling back a half a round, but it's kind of surprised. I, I'm kind of surprised, too. I think people are willing to buy because we know what the upside is on Ben Simmons. Like, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, the, the downside is that he's not going to show up and he's not going to play, which is a pretty, which is a lot of risk. But I'm not sure. And if you listen to the low post, by the way, if you don't listen to it, Zach Lowe's podcast, the low post, you need to listen to it. I mean, absolutely incredible content. Every time it gets dropped into my, into my podcast feed, I like pretty much snap instantly. It listens to it, listen to it. And it's just like incredible insight kind of uh, from very smart NBA minds, but also they get some behind the scenes stuff with, with beat writers and, and, you know, they're in a little bit in the know with, uh, with some of the teams. Um, like, I mean, that was where I really got locked into what Jordan Poole's role was going to be like a week and a half ago or whatever. So anyway, if you listen to them, um, like Zach says, he really doesn't think that Ben Simmons is going to hold out. And that's what that's seems to be the consensus that Ben is going to show up at a certain point, which could be a little bit of a disaster, <laughs> could be a disaster because Daryl Morey is not going to um, sell him for pennies on the dollar, which I also think is probably true. However, the flip side is they do get a real trade offer and they flip Ben for somebody. And Ben goes, you know, Ben goes to Minnesota and it's wheels up on his fantasy value, right? Ben goes to, I, I would argue, even if Ben goes to, I don't, I, supposedly Golden State is not, uh, supposedly Golden State is not interested, but 
Like if he went to Golden State, I think he would be a smash there too. So anyway, where almost anywhere that Ben Simmons goes, he's probably going to be a smash. So it does make sense that his his uh, price isn't really falling too too much. Please don't take my guy. Just let me have one. Just let me have one of my guys. That's all I ask. These are always so painful when you know that. Yes, I do like Cade. Uh, but another thing, another takeaway from last night, a guy I've been, I'm, I'm, ham I'm hammering Nurk. I'm absolutely hammering Yusuf Nurkic uh, and going to continue to at this cost. He hinted uh, earlier this off season that, you know, the issue with Nurk as well, A has been health. And so I guess that's technically always still an issue, but they've been like kind of fluky injuries, right? It's not like he's got the recurring back thing that MPJ has or, or, or the recurring ankle thing that Steph has. It's just been kind of like some flu, you know, break your leg. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, uh, you know, like kind of wear and tear type injury. So anyway, the big thing with Nurk was Stotts never played. Like he averaged what, what did he average less than 30 minutes a game? Stotts would not play him. He would never, he, he, in the regular season, he never got to even like 34 minutes. And supposedly Nurk is talking, you know, hinting that Chauncey's kind of going to unleash him. And product production, especially in a points-based format, like uh, in a points-based format with steals and blocks, uh, that has never been an issue for Nurk. It's just minutes and health. And so if he stays healthy and he gets more minutes, I mean, he, he could be just an absolute smash in the fifth round. So I'm really high on Nurk. Simmons came down about six to ten, six to ten spots. Yeah, yeah, Nurkic is definitely foul prone, but I'm not worried about that. You know, you can't predict. I mean, Jokic gets in foul trouble. Joe Val gets in foul trouble. Guys get in foul trouble. You know, it is. I, I, I can't. You, I can't worry about that. About that too much. It's going to happen. He's going to have games where he plays less because he gets in foul trouble, and it just is what it is. Draymond fouls too much. Right. I mean, it, that's part of part of part of being a big man, too, in the NBA. You know, Jokic has had a lot of foul troubles over his his career. It's cooled off and figured out. Din Matt, you're not I'm 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 not tweeting out again when I'm when I'm doing a draft. We're not we're not doing this thing where you take all my guys, Matt. I'm very much I'm very much annoyed with you right now. So I'm taking Keldon, which is fine. But we are not friends. Dinwiddie, I'm also. I feel like I need to do more drafts today because I think this Dinwiddie price is pretty egregious. Uh, he's one of my favorite values. I think I have him tagged as a core play, core pick um, on the website on SpikeWeek.com. If you go under the NBA tab, you'll see core picks, players to fade, rankings, etc. Working on yet another rankings update. Today, I'm going to be continually um, updating rankings every day, pretty much, leading up until the season. So anyway, Dinwiddie is like a smash. I love, I love uh, Spencer Dinwiddie. It's like, I can't quite figure out if people just like don't respect the name, like don't respect him at kind of as a, a player or what. But like, we removed Russell Westbrook from this offense. I mean, Spencer Dinwiddie is not going to do what Russell Westbrook did, but you basically just drop Dinwiddie in. Bradley Beal has the kind of a little bit of uncertainty around exactly how many games he's going to, you know, it, th there's a little uncertainty around Bradley Beal, right? And even then, like Bradley Beal isn't going to do every single thing with Spencer Dinwiddie on the floor. I think Din and who else? Like Kuz, you know, Rui is away from the team right now. I assume he's going to be back eventually. Like, they don't have dudes to like take on high usage and they don't have anybody really to like run the offense besides him and Beal. Everything's going to flow through Dinwiddie and Beal and Dinwiddie, I think is just going to absolutely light it up this year. Matt, let me know when you take a nap. Will you DM me in discord please so that I can get in these drafts and I can get some of the guys that I actually want. Thank you. Talking about Dinwiddie, Terrence. He's a baller. I also just really like Spencer Dinwiddie. And at the end of the day, what fun is it 
you know, what's the let's have some fun with our teams and our drafts, right? I'm a Spencer Dinwiddie fan, so I'm going to enjoy having Spencer Dinwiddie on my teams. He was also really, really productive in Brooklyn in like semi similar situations, right? Remember, like him and Karis, this pre uh, big three that they had, it was like, you know, they made the run in the bubble and stuff. Uh, that was with Karis doing everything. But before that, ooh, this is gross. How many Spurs do I have? I don't want to take Derek White, I feel like. Ooh, but I might have to. Yikes. I am actually... Gonna take Coos. I am kind of, I am kind of on Coos as as a wing, and then uh, it was a lot. Uh, Matt, of course, takes Time Lord, who was another guy that I was considering. Um, what I like about what I like about this, it's funny, it's funny you ask, it's funny you ask this question, Mark, because I've fallen into. I think a lot of the construction revolves around the wing position because of how thin it is both up top and depth wise and how weak the mid tier is, how you attack the wing position. I feel like is like wing is kind of like running back, if you will, in, uh, in fantasy football, not the same in terms of like, you know, running back has the fragility aspect to it. Like guys get hurt more often. They're replaceable, blah, blah, blah. That's not the case for wings, but just in terms of the thinness, you know, the, the guys up top are so good. The middle tier is so bad. And the guys down below are like, right. Like I love precious, but like, also, we have to be realistic about what Precious and Chuma Okiki and we have to be realistic about what the true like probability of a ceiling from those guys is. So how you approach wing, I think, is where my construction ends up lying. And so I do like to attack wing early where when it makes sense, not like totally reaching for guys. Like I really like, obviously, when you get Giannis, that's nice. Zion is one of my favorite picks. Paul George is one of my favorite picks. Tatum. Jalen Brown, et cetera, right? MPJ. When I can get those guys when it makes sense, I like to be a little bit wing heavy and then like almost be done. So like with this build, like I have the flexibility. If I really only want to take four, like if I think I'm going to be really wing at guard, which I might, I might be really wing at guard um, on this, on this team. Ooh, baby. Let me check out bigs. I've been taking so much Maxi or Marcus Smart. We're gonna take Maxi just because I need to bet on the upside, I think, but I'm a little a little bothered by just how expensive Maxi has gotten. However, anyway, back to the construction thing. I think I think, you know, it really revolves around how you handle wing at first. Because like this, oh this opens me up here. Uh, let me click the board. You know, this opens me up. If I really only want to take these four wings, I can take just four wings. I can tack on a fifth late if I want to as well, obviously. Um, but guard being the deepest has typically led me to more volume at guard. Like that's what this draft will probably end up being, right? A lot of these kind of upside bets at guard and then only four or five wings and like three bigs. And that's it. Um, yeah, it's painful, dude. I almost didn't take him because that that's like sticker shock. But I also just want to make sure I get enough Maxi because I think he's kind of one of the guys that can like break the season, basically. Um, so I don't want to be like out in the cold on, on Maxi. I do think like double early center... And like only taking two is a really fun strategy. You can still take three, like take two early guys and then like take a late flyer on an upside guy. Like, how do you say it's Sangoon? I don't even know how to say his, his, his name from, from the Rockets or obviously I really like Olenek or if you like, you know, Wendell Carter, different guys like that. Mo Bamba actually looks kind of interesting to me now, but right. But there's a ton of like these upside kind of flyer late guys. I think, you know, elite early center is another really strong 
strategy, but I do think there are a lot, right? Like Matt just took time Lord, um, you know, Boucher was just, was just available and just taken. Um, I mean, Jared Allen is a reasonable mid round pick, right? Uh, I'm, I'm definitely missing guys. Jaron Jackson, you know, there's tons and tons of, of like guys that are like nice upside bets that I don't want to back. I'm basically not trying to back myself into any, any sort of corner on any strategy. Oh man. Gafford. So here's another one. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to end up taking him, but I really like Gafford uh, at, at wing. And that's a dude who's risen. We were talking about, uh, we were talking about guys who've risen up a lot. Daniel Gafford, my goodness. That has been a crazy riser, um, which is also unfortunate because he he was one of my favorite picks, and now he is expensive. Dude, dude, dude. This has been an awkward draft. I'm not very happy with how this is turning out. I'm not going to lie to you. I have almost no Devontae Graham, but I feel like this is a fine spot to take him when I'm just taking – Depth at guard, right? Give me, give me some usable weeks, Devonte Graham. Yeah, I just heard that too. I just heard that too, which is exciting. And Mo Bamba, uh, like, has been a guy taking just a little bit of Mo Bamba. I've taken more Wendell Carter, but I think it makes both of them a lot more interesting. They don't have any, like, it's Chuma, right? Chuma is like their only like wing slash versatile big type guy to play at that like kind of small four or whatever you want to call that position right they just, like don't have any of those guys it's like a million guards and so them experimenting with Wendell Carter and Mo Bamba together like unlocks the ceiling for those guys you know they just need to play whichever one of those guys gets playing or if both of them get playing time they're going to be great picks at value you just need them to play right and that's why we draft productive players and often young players because they just need to grow and and earn more of a role right mo bamba needs to figure it the hell out <laughs> and get more playing time and then he will smash for fantasy because that's what he does he's productive period end of discussion um i haven't done a ton i think matt has done more of the two big builds because i tend to like tacking on so how i also think about the structure as it relates to these fragile ones is um, when you get to like the last round or the 15th round or whatever, you know, as, assuming you're not like outraged, like let, let's say you didn't take a wing for the first eight or nine rounds in that scenario, you need, you need to just really lean to like wing or whatever. But when you get to the 15th or 16th round and you're not like super, super hyper fragile, then it's like take the best available player. Cause you're just trying to find a flex play. And so sometimes I do, you know, they're, they're my, the best guy might be uh, a big, but I don't think the two bigs is, is, is too fragile because at the end of the day, if you draft two really good ones, they can both be in your lineup when they're healthy. If something, if something happens to one of them, you're still filling that, that, that one big spot with a really, really good player, like a really good player, right? If you take Carl Anthony Towns and uh, Nurkic, like if something happens to, to one of them, you're still fine at the big position. And then you have all this volume of all these other guys to fill. What is going on with this Gafford plummet? You guys are killing me. Um, so I, I think, and maybe this is just my crazy galaxy brain, but I think that these like fragile approaches are are not as fragile as maybe we make them out to be. And I think that that's why that there's such a big edge. Everybody's drafting 16 guys and you, you really don't have that many starting spots to fill. And you're probably filling your starting spots from a very select portion of your roster. The fragility comes in where you need to hit ceilings. You need to be fragile, right? If you draft Carl Anthony Towns and bam, you like, if they if they collapse, like you're probably screwed anyway. Your your first and second round pick are her are are donezo. If one of them collapses, you're fine. You're still you're still covering your big position with one of the best big men in the NBA for that stretch, and you're fine. 
what you are going to need most likely is as many upside shots on the other positions because you're behind, right? Your opponents have Giannis and Luca and Harden and KD and Paul George and Tatum, right? Your opponents are beating you at the other position. So you need to find the upside at the other spots. And like, are you going to find it? I don't know, but you need as many shots on goal at those guys at the other positions to kind of make up, make up that ground. God bless it. I was saving, I was saving my third big spot for, for KO. I almost took him over blood. So, and I knew that I should have done it because I knew in this draft, I was never going to get one of the guys that I, that I wanted. This is not, this is not fun guys. I'm not having fun. It's too early to be tilting my face off because of you guys see what a gross gross at least i have see i have cat and nurk so i shouldn't be sweat i'm just sitting here talking about how i shouldn't be sweat you shouldn't be sweating having a cat and nurk pairing and then the fact that i didn't get olenic uh is making me tilt my face off so i guess i'm a little bit of a hypocrite but damn it olenic is one of my favorite Olenek might be my favorite pick in the entire player pool. We're going to go with a little Norm here. Oh, hip injury. Oh, that's not good. Barton didn't play. Let's, well, let's hope Norm's okay. Too late. Did someone just say you took pool? Good Lord, man. You guys are killing me. Where did pool go? 10-10. Well, late round pool is uh, officially uh, over. It's fun while it lasted. It's fun while it lasted. <laughs> KO is a baller. So is Jordan Poole. So he was going in the 12th or 13th. Uh, he was going in the 12th or 13th, you said, earlier today. Boy, things are a changing. That's painful. That hurts. That hurts my soul. Like, seriously hurts my soul. All of my guys. Every single one of my favorite players is uh, steamed. So brutal, man. So painful. I wonder what do you what do you guys think? Uh, so we're gonna see these guys get steamed. Unfortunately, it's all the guys that we like, right? We're gonna see these guys get steamed. Who gets anti-steamed? Right? Like who? is going to fall that like, you know, we saw it during football season. The best example, if you guys played NFL best ball was like Jamar chase, right. Had some preseason had preseason drops and just like all the news was bad about Jamar chase. And so he plummets multiple rounds in drafts. And like, if you scooped him up, you feel like a goddamn genius, right? Like <laughs> he's smashing it, it. Like it was silly for him to fall. I'm trying to think of, and I, I can't really think of anybody off the top of my head that's like they might, they might fall down boards that I really want to try to scoop up. So I think that's the biggest difficulty is some of my guys are rising, right? Pool, Olenek, um, you know, Dejounte. What? Uh, I guess Zion falling would be one of them. Zion falling um, would be a guy. Trying to, th I'm really trying to think, and I don't have any good answers to that. Let's see where I'm at. Five, four, two. Okay. I, I like, I like the haze. I like the haze pick. Matt, of course. Oh, Christ, Matt. You're 
killing me, dude. Mitch Rob is falling quite a bit. Which is pretty interesting. Um, I don't really love Gary Trent, but I see your I see your comment, Alan. I forgot to go back and see positional value scarcity is far more important on you where those sites have multiple. And you really need to hammer. Let me read this again. I feel like positional value and scarcity is far more important because there's yeah. Because it because you're going to lose, like it's kind of like you know if you win the flex on DraftKings and drafters, like you're probably going to win because that in turn means you're winning multiple other positions, right? And then you can make up th through through volume at, at the other positions, but like you're starting less players here on on underdog, and so when wings run out you're like even further behind because you can't make up for it with that next flex right when bigs run out you can't you like you're not catching the Jokic cat teams or whatever you know bigs a little bit different but you know wing especially even guard to a lesser extent guards deep with with uh like selectable options but like it's not that deep with like good up like super upside bets you know what i mean so uh that's an interesting interesting point um you also had another comment that i forgot and i missed i that's a very fair point i've been pretty like out on lowry but it might be time to buy a little bit because he's definitely uh, he's definitely falling a lot, and it's really for no reason other than I think the market is just kind of adjusting. Maybe he was a little overvalued, but Lowry is a good one. I think that that's a pretty good one. I feel terrified that like I have my guys, and you guys are all going to take them, and it's freaking me out. Um, yeah, let me make my pick and then hit these. Hit a couple of comments. Here's another guy I really like. Monte. So where am I at? Seven. Okay, up to seven guards. Should get to at least eight. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I do not want to leave draft season with no hero. And I do think having some Lowry makes sense. Just for, you know, Jimmy's going to miss games which I mean, Jimmy's going to miss games. Let's be real. I think, Low I think Lowry makes some sense. And I think hero, you know, he just shot the ball well last night, but like, it's kind of the point. Um, if he's going to get, if he's going to get some extended looks with none gone, um, you know, and them being a little weaker in terms of their ancillary options. I don't want to leave with no hero. This is a, this is a good one. Isaac and Okiki with the kind of injuries and just the, the, you know, just the oddity around Jonathan Isaac. This is a pretty good one, actually. Like I would honestly, um, people are saying like, Oh, we can draft Andrew Wiggins now. Like I'm still not really into Andrew Wiggins. I get he, he's, he's fine. But like, I don't think Andrew Wiggins is making or breaking this season, honestly, as a draft pick, no matter what his vaccination status was. But like Kyrie could, and Kyrie's definitely falling. Kyrie's definitely falling. So um, that's a pretty interesting one. I struggle with like the Lowry thing. I can like wrap my head around like, should we or should we not buy a little bit of, of Kyle Lowry, like buy the dip on Kyle Lowry? Because it's just like a actual like basketball discussion and a fantasy basketball discussion. I don't know what to like. I don't have a take. Like I, how can you have a real take on the Kyrie thing? It's like, the guy's like totally out there, you know, he thinks the earth is flat and he doesn't want to get vaccinated. Will he do it because his team needs him to win a championship? I mean, I would like to think so, but how the hell am I supposed to know? I'm not, I, the guy walks around the court before games with Sage. He's saging NBA courts. Like, how are we supposed to predict what that guy's going to do? So it's like, should you buy the dip on Kyrie? I don't know. Like Kyrie doesn't even know what he's like. Kyrie's lost his mind. 
So I hate that one. That one sucks. So it's, it's impossible for any of us to figure out, you know? Yeah, I do think this is a good point, actually. And Bam is my favorite beneficiary of that thing. But I do think that the, the you know, Duncan Robinson is Duncan Robinson. He's only going to run around and shoot threes. Uh, PJ Tucker is just going to stand in the corner and play defense. So he's not going to do anything. Um, Kyle Lowry isn't really like a high usage player, but he's going to help, you know, just going to help their team by being Kyle Lowry, right? Doing the little things, playing defense, shooting threes, running the offense. Take a little bit of pressure off Jimmy and off Bam. Um, but like hero coming off the bench, you know, I, I don't know what's going on with Depot, but like, I do think that the, the usage is going to be fairly concentrated. I think that that's a very fair point. You are, you are asking the wrong person. I'll let somebody in chat answer that question. I don't know. Maybe I am not a Euro. I'm not a, a non NBA. Oh my God, Matt. I don't think we can be friends after this, buddy. I hope you have enjoyed being a member of Spike Week because that is going to come to an end. And now I'm sort of panicking and I'm taking Poku. You backed me into freaking Poku. I hope you I hope you're happy with yourself. I hope you're happy with yourself. Yeah. I really like the it's awkward because I'm I'm really so on Nurk and I do actually kind of like Norm as like a value pick and I like I like Roko uh a decent bit. I even think like Nance can can make some sense, right? But it's like this weird thing where Dame's going in the first round and like I mean Dame's one of my favorite players in the NBA, but he's a difficult for me to take in the first round as a guard and a you know a guard who's doesn't he's just points. It's a lot of points, right? He's not a mega stat stuffer um and cj is the kind of the same thing i don't like the price really on dame and cj and so they're difficult so i kind of like the, the the ancillary pieces if you can call nurk an ancillary piece nurk roko norm me too i i i fear he's gonna come out and double double and uh ruin ruin his draft stock as well yeah, it's so dumb. It's so dumb. Roby is obviously the center, and Poku is 140 pounds. Why is he a big? But I also don't want to have zero. I think Poku might be the worst basketball player I've ever seen play in my entire life. But I don't want to have zero Poku either, just because he is going to do a lot of stuff. And I think they were, they have all the reason in the world to let him go out there and be a wild man. So suck it up and take some Poku. Let's see. Have you guys already taken my my? Uh... Hold on, I don't want to take it because I don't want to. KJ Martin, that's nice. I like KJ Martin. Okay, is Precious still here? You guys are not gonna rob me of every single one of my guys. Yeah, he was he 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 improved. He's still terrible. Yeah, Wing Gafford. I don't get it. Some of the positions are wild, but that's that's the edge, right? It's the market has gotten smarter on like Gafford, Roby, um, Basically, like the bigs playing wing are like that's like a cheat code, right? Because we know how bad wing is, and so you can get a start. Daniel Gafford is a starting center, like they they said Ga they expect Gafford to start. Gafford is a starting center for the Wizards, so you can pick in the eleventh round and play as a wing. That's amazing. That's pretty true. I don't know what Poku was a hybrid of, like a flamingo and a human. Like not even close. The uh, the DK ADP is really funny. It's so bad. Oh my god, it's so bad. But it's also so bad on a couple of the guys that I like. So like Kelly Olynyk goes in. What's he going in here in the one thirties? Yeah, 
133, and he used to go later than that. He used to go in like the 150s here. Um, he used to go in like the 150s. But like <laughs> on DraftKings, his ADP is like in the 60s, 70. And like I love Kelly Olynyk, but <laughs> let's let's pump the brakes a little bit here. You know what I mean? It's a little much for me, I think. But yeah, your point is uh, very, very true. Very, very true. But again, that's something we can take advantage of. Just like the, the kind of some of the screwed up positions, we can take advantage of the... You know, ADP, the like there's 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 probably guys still on underdog that are not appropriately priced. I think Kelly Olinick is not appropriately priced on underdog. We can take advantage of that and then take advantage of other guys on DraftKings. Spencer Dinwiddie is in like the 70s or something like that. Jalen Suggs is like at pick nearly a hundred or something like that on DraftKings. It's egregious. So we just take advantage of that over there. Um and unfortunately, excuse me, draft in a more efficient market here on underdog. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I would love to sit here and like, oh, fragile this, you know, zero wing that, blah, blah, blah. I mean, at the end of the day on DraftKings, it is almost like that. I mean, you don't want to be an idiot, you know, with your and take three guards or something like that. But like, I think that's that's part of the big thing with with like just generally underdog. Oops. I'm going to double check. Uh, Taylor. Make sure there's not anybody. I keep taking Davion, and I should probably diversify a little bit more, which is why I was looking at THT and Pritchard and some of these other late round guys. I I take a lot of Davion, and I still really like Davion, but I should uh, I should diversify a little bit. Um, I don't even remember what I was going to say right now, but it hurts watching some of these guys get steamed. Yeah. It's painful. The shifts are pretty wild in, in NBA. That's for sure. Suggs is a baller. Suggs is a baller. I'm very, I'm very bullish on Suggs. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I mean, I know why they've traded some guys and they just so happen to get point guards back. RJ Hampton, um, et cetera. But, you know, and then they obviously still have Fultz. And then they just drafted the best player available, which I which I think is smart. Like, don't pass on Jalen Suggs because you have Markel Fultz and RJ Hampton. If they all work out, it'll be fine. They're so far away from winning that they should just take the best player available. It's unfortunate for us <laughs> because ideally if those guys were spread around to different teams or whatever, they might be uh, – it, it might be a better situation for all of them. But – I'm still just going to draft Suggs, I think, uh, the most out of that situation. Yeah, I think, uh, again, same thing from uh, the low post and uh, and some other news that's been out there on their situation. It appears, so, no, now I say this, and Willie Hernan Gomez started last night without with Joe Val out, but the, the rumblings have been that they want Jackson to be the backup center. Um, and I think that that could mean some productive games, right? Joe Val's definitely not going to play every single game. Um, and I think Hayes is as good of a late round kind of flyer guy as a, so that, see, there was, that was my 30th, that was my 30th draft. I'm not a sicko like Matt doing, uh, having 90 drafts in already, but I do need to pick up the pace. And that's part of why we're drafting uh, multiple times a week, multiple times a week here on spike week. And so before I log out, I do want to say, yeah, like he's definitely like a hundred percent going to get a bump and he should, he should get a bump. He was under, he Jordan pool was underpriced. I don't know what I haven't figured out. I haven't redone any rankings or anything like that. I haven't, I'm not sure where I'm, where I'm going to put Jordan pool. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know about 10th, 10th, 11th round. We'll see. Like I said, I don't want to speak on it yet because I haven't redone any, any rankings or, or anything. Cheers, Terrence. 
Thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for all being here as usual. Um, if you are in the NFL streets, I'll be back later this afternoon streaming a results recap, finally getting into some of the results. Um, hopefully have the leaderboard updated for the drafters free roll and kind of talking about some things that we can take away from these, these first four weeks of NFL into our in-season drafts. If you want to do some NFL drafts, that'll be Monday, Wednesday, Friday moving forward. So tomorrow will be the next NFL draft. And if you're just here for the NBA, which I totally get, um, I'm all in on NBA season, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So Thursday at this exact time will be the next NBA best ball draft here on Spike Week. So for me and for my dogs who actually didn't go absolutely crazy for the first time ever on the show and for all you guys for, for joining me, thanks. And I will see you this afternoon.